All right, I'm Sarah Gordon. I'm the curator here at the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. And I'm so glad to see you all here for this workshop on visual art grant applications steps to success. Um, we will be here for up to an hour and a half. We have a fantastic panel. Um, before we get into it, I just have a few items to cover. Um, first of all, we have a few other CAH staff on the call helping out supporting in both technical and content. Uh, we have Ron Humbertson, Art Collections Registrar. There he is. Um, we have Alyssa Maru, I think is here. She's our Public Art Program Coordinator. I believe we have Lauren Dugas Glover on the line, who is the Public Art Manager. So thanks to all of these staff members. I think Vanessa Ackham may also be on the line. Thank you, Vanessa, I see you. Um, I want to mention too, we have at least a couple of our commissioners in attendance. So I see Alma Gates and Hector Torres are here. Um, there may be others and I want to thank you. Hey, Hector, I see you. Um, I want to thank our commissioners for everything they do to support the commission and in turn to support the arts community here in DC. Um, a couple of technical notes. You should be muted upon arrival into the room and it would be great if you could stay muted for the most part. Um, just so that we don't have a lot of, you know, extra noise, but we do definitely want your participation. This is all about kind of, um, you know, guiding potential applicants on their grant applications. And so there are a couple of ways you can participate. You can drop chat, um, drop questions into the chat box and we will be bringing those out. You can also use the raise hand function. Um, which is at the bottom of your, oh, I'm sorry, it's in the participant um, uh, area next to your name. And then we can unmute you and you can um, speak your question. So um, also this session is being recorded and it will be available afterwards on our website if you wanna go back and see it again or if there are other people who are interested. All right, let me share, um, some images again. There are several visual art grants that CAH offers, and I just want to kind of run down what those are before we start. This session is not um, geared toward any particular grant program. It's really designed to be of use for any visual art grant that you're applying to. Um, but as far as what we are offering, we do have, um, I think, five that I want to mention. The first is public art building communities. This is open now. The deadline is in July, and this is for artists and organizations who are looking to design, fabricate and install um, public works of art that really connect with their communities. We have, um, sorry, Murals DC, which is also open now and the deadline is very soon. It's Friday, April 23rd. This is in partnership with the um, Department of Public Works. And for this, we're looking for graffiti and aerosol mural artists and teams to create murals as part of the DC murals DC program. If you're specifically interested in this, um, there is a chat happening at one o'clock. So we're overlapping a little bit, but you can always hop off of this and onto that chat if you're interested. Opening soon, so in early May, we have Art Bank, and this is how the commission acquires fine art for our collection, and it is then loaned out to um, government agency buildings to be displayed in public um, spaces. We have our art exhibition or curatorial grant. This is for curators who are looking to develop and present um, exhibitions of visual art, and these exhibitions happen in our um, gallery, which is in our lobby at 200 I Street Southeast and or our virtual gallery, which we've been using since last summer in light of COVID. And then finally, we have the Arts and Humanities Fellowship Program, and this is a grant to individual artists um, who contribute to the artistic excellence of this region. And it's really it's just a grant to do your work. So um, again, these last three will be opening in early May. Um, and if you are interested in these grants and more information about them, we can answer some questions today, but um, I recommend that you get on our mailing list. And I think that 
that information will be dropped into the chat. So today's workshop, again, it was really designed for visual artists applying to all sorts of grants, CAH and other places. And we're going to cover kind of some of the main um, items that you're often asked to produce um, when you're applying for these grants. So resume or CV, artist bio, artist statement, and then the work sample or portfolio. Um, I know there are a lot of other materials that are often requested, including renderings, layouts, support material, budgets, references, administrative documents, project proposals. Yes, there is. there can be a lot, a lot of paperwork for these. Um, once our grants are open, we do have workshops that are geared specifically toward applying for our grants. And during those workshops, we really talk about kind of the different documents, you know, government documents that are required and things like that. So, we won't cover that specific material as much today, um, but feel free to attend our specific grant workshops um, later in the spring for that information. All right, so I am very excited now to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have three panelists today. Two of them are sort of here representing um, grant applicants who have had success with their applications and then one who's specifically here as a former panelist so she can kind of talk to you from the panelists perspective so our first panelist is Catherine Sulan Mann Catherine studied at Brown University she's giving you a wave um, and at the Maryland Institute of Contemporary Art and has exhibited widely throughout the DC area and New York as well as abroad in India, Canada, Cameroon, Taiwan, and Switzerland. She has received several CAH grants, including the, um, the Artist Fellowship, the Art Bank, um, Projects, Events, and Festivals, which is kind of a whole other beast. Um, and she's also worked on two Civic Commission public art projects with CAH. So maybe just give a wave again, Catherine. All right. Um, our second panelist is Marcel Taylor. Marcel studied fine art at Howard University, um, including African art, Western art, and global architecture. In 1996, he co founded Sage Collective, which is um, sorry, which is a diverse group of visual and performing artists. And with Sage, he has organized and sponsored art exhibitions and exposed youth to art. Um, he undertook a residence at Art Omi International Artists under the guidance of Sam, Sam Gilliam. And his current body of cityscapes he describes as attempts to interpret the many moods of urban space by capturing the essence of light, shadow, sound, symmetry, rhythm um, with vibrantly painted brush strokes. Marcel has received art bank grants, um, the fellowship grants, and also public art building communities. Um, and he also served on a fellowship panel. So he does also have panel experience. And by panel, what I'm referring to is um, in the process of applying for grants at CAH, once your application is submitted, um, all of the applications that are, um, that are accepted or that, are, um, uh, that fulfill the requirements are reviewed by a panel of professionals in the field. So artists, art historians, curators, um, arts leaders in the region. So that's what I'm referring to when I say panels, that's the review panel. So our third um, contributor today is Zoe Charlton. And I'm looking for Zoe. She's here, yeah, I see her. Okay, hi Zoe. So Zoe um, has served on the faculty at American University in the art department for 16 years, including as chair of the department. She received degrees from the University of Texas at Austin and Florida State University. Um, her work has been included in exhibitions at places such as, the, such as the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, the Harvey B. Gantt Center, Contemporary Art Museum in Houston, the Studio Museum of Harlem, and um, the National Gallery of Art in Warsaw, Poland. Her work is in public collections, including the Birmingham Museum of Art, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Phillips Collection here in DC. Uh, Zoe was also an animator for Flat Black Films in Austin, Texas. 
um, currently holds a seat on the Maryland State Arts Council and is co-founder of Syndicate, an artist project space in Baltimore. And Zoe has served as an art bank panelist for CAH. So we're going to start moving through these different topics. And again, we're gonna kind of go topic by topic and have discussion with the panelists. And I want you to feel free to um, drop questions in the chat at, at any time. And we'll try to kind of take those as we, as we move along. So I will share another image with you. The first topic we're gonna to talk about is writing a CV or resume. So this is kind of the basic, you know, um, summary of an artist's career. And as you see here, I've, you know, we've just listed kind of some of the main um, items that typically are covered in a CV and resume, contact info, website if you have one, your live work location, art related education, exhibition history, collections where your work resides, awards or other professional achievements, any media coverage you might have had, other art related work, and sometimes significant upcoming projects. So I will kind of turn it over to the panelists now and I wanna just start by asking Marcel and Catherine and I'll take this off so we can look at each other. Um, kind of what your best advice is for grant applicants in putting together CVs and resumes. Um, I'll, I'll just jump out there. I think for me, as far as my CV, I just try to make sure I put all of my best experience out there, uh, meaning uh, my exhibition uh, experience, um, all of those, even if they're group shows or whatever, uh, the media experience, um, awards, if you have them, Make sure you put those, uh, your school experience, um, your education, especially your art education. You wanna make sure to highlight those. Um, yeah, that's about it. Just make sure you put all of your artistic experience out there and uh, make sure they're upfront and highlighted, especially the, the shows and the awards as, as far as I'm, as far as I, uh, as far as my experience. <clears throat> um, I'd say, so I keep several different versions of my resume on my computer. Um, I have like one master CV, which is kind of a, it's at this point, it's kind of too long. <laughs> Um, of every, just every show I've ever been in, every art fair I've ever participated in, um, as, uh, it's kind of a master list. Um, and then I also keep different versions of that CV for applications because I don't think anybody wants to see every single tiny little thing that I've ever done. Every like coffee shop I've done my painting in. Um, so I keep a one a list, a, a CV that's only one page. I keep a CV that's only the past five years. Um, I keep a CV that is uh, focusing on my experience teaching, like a teaching CV um, for applying to jobs, which is a very different kind of CV or resume than um, one that I would use for grant applications. But I generally list um, my work my name, contact information, I follow that with my education, follow that with grants and uh, honors, any awards, uh, follow that by solo shows um, or two person shows, and then follow that with group exhibitions and then finish it up with uh, media. Um, and I, if I had a, I've also included um, collections that I've been a part of at the very end, if if it's if it's called for. But I think that the most important thing for that is your CV is a living document, and you should be tailoring it for whatever you apply for. Oh, I also have a public art CV, that one too. 
Zoe, from your end as a panelist, when you're reviewing all of these CDs that come in, is are there certain things that you're looking for or that, you know, particularly catch your eye? Yeah, you know, um, I'm really happy to hear Marcel and Catherine talk about the categories that they have on their CVs. And as a panelist, that becomes really important because it lets me know uh, how much the applicant applicant has read through the prospectus, the the uh, what we're asking for. And so it really does let me know, are folks looking at the uh, required information? Are they thinking about what actually um, contributes to a better understanding of the fullness of their career if that's required? Um, I, it's really important what Catherine just said that there are multiple versions of a, uh, a CV or resume that she has uh, because sometimes you don't need to see people's teaching experience Sometimes it interferes with being able to get to the information that I'm looking for the most quickly. So I'm also looking at uh, how easy it is to read through information. That's extremely important. The font, the way that it's laid out, um, the way that it's organized, I think that those things are very particular, yeah. And also, some depending on the proposal, it would be great to see. Sometimes it's important to see the other uh, the other applications or residencies or things that someone has applied for, because it lets me know about their level of ambition. So we have a couple of questions st starting to come in. Um, one yeah, is whether there's a template of a resume that we can share. And I can share, actually, um, our panelists have agreed to let us share their resumes. So um, I can pull up Catherine's resume or uh, CV to show. We don't have, we didn't prepare kind of a template for to send to people, but we'll show you an example. Um, while I'm doing that, perhaps our panelists could speak to the next question, which is, if your education is not in the fine arts, is there any usefulness to listing the education you do have? Yes, definitely. Um, if you, if the other panelists don't mind me just saying this, yes, definitely. Education is typically a part of a CV and you always just list that there. Um, it's just a part of the kind of professional things that one does. Um, even if it's not in the arts, that's completely fine because sometimes you don't know uh, the other perspectives that the, uh, or the other information that actually might be the thing that um, pushes your application forward even more. For instance, if, um, if your educational, is exper ex educational experience is within education, it might be really interesting for people looking at your CV or offering you the opportunity. They might say, oh, this is great, this person might be able to, um, you know, participate or create a workshop about uh, on how to do something, how to teach something. They might be able to connect more with the docents at at our institution, et cetera. So I think that's really important. I think one should always list their education. Yeah, it seems like it's act that would actually be a great benefit to your application. It makes you stand out from the crowd. Um, so it's not just a bunch of BFAs and MFAs. You have something kind of separate and special that makes you stand apart. I would like lead with that. I will add that in our art bank collection, it's so interesting because we have artists who have been uh, CIA agents, attorneys, city planners, scientists, um, and, you know, different applications stand out for different reasons, but it's certainly not something that eliminates you by any means from, from consideration. Yeah. I would just add a little bit that, um, though your, let's say your educational background may be uh, a little bit limited or not necessarily the arts, put it on the CV. Um, as well as your experience. I mean, you might not, some people might have a very limited CV, but uh, don't be intimidated by that. You know, put your experience there, your shows or whatever. Um, and it might not be very long. Some people have a very extensive where they have to cut it down a little bit, but 
you know, just uh, submit what you have, uh, your experience, and uh, just go from there. Oh my gosh, you know what, Marcel? I love that you said all that um, because people, we don't know what brings people to making, right? And seeing the fullness of their history, being able to represent oneself fully is so important. So yeah, definitely include all the information that makes you who you are. Um, I'm curious what you guys think. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was, was going to say is there are, there, there are a lot of applicants, but at the same time, if you, um, We'll get into it further. I mean, if you're answering the questions and you're submitting your bio your work, your work is, is going to stand up just like the other person. It doesn't, the, the CV is, is uh, part of the application, but it's not the whole application. That's all I'm going to say. So let me just share um, this sample CV with you. This is Catherine's, just so you can kind of take a look at the format, the font, just you know, in this case, it's very easily kind of legible. Um, I know we have more questions in the chat and we will come to those, but I just wanted you to be able to take a look at this. So again, contact information, education. Catherine's lucky enough to have lots of honors and grants. solo shows, and then group exhibitions. What also makes Catherine's uh, CV um, accessible is really just the way that it's laid out. It is understandable. The spacing in between the lines um, doesn't make it look like one show is running into the other one. Um, that's really important. It's just, it's legible. So bibliography is, is kind of media that we were talking about, articles about her work. Um, Catherine, I have a question for you. I noticed that you have dates on specific dates for your exhibitions. Could you talk a little bit about uh, the why you've done that, why you've chosen to do that? Yeah, so I, I think having everything by date is the the way that the cv becomes legible um so i i have not been a panelist for the commission but i have been on juries before and you're interested in what people have done recently mm -hmm. so like when i create my cv i try to focus on things that have happened in relatively recent years you can see like the cv i go back um to you know, it looks like, I don't know how far I go back. I go back pretty far, mm -hmm. um, but I try to organize it so that a, a panelist can look at the most recent things first, because um, I'm pretty sure that that's what they would be interested in. Yeah. And the only reason why I wanted you to talk about that too, is that, um, as a panelist, I've on, on different kinds of um, with different kinds of organizations. I've come across CVs that actually don't list dates; they just list the places, and it's very confusing sometimes to see when, how active people are, when was their most recent show, etc. Right? Um, so it's just really important. It seems like it would be, of course, you should always write dates, but that's not always the case. There are many folks that don't include their dates even dates with their education, et cetera. I, I feel like with, with all things regarding when you put together an application, it's, it's helpful because you want to be getting the grant, but then it's also helpful because it holds a mirror up back up to yourself for your own practice. Um, even a CV does that. Uh, it's helpful to look back and be like, oh, look, this is, these are the things that I did in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a useful thing just for your own practice as well. Um, I'd say that my CV is a pretty traditional one. Um, you know, I'm leading with education and then I'm following with the th three main categories of my honors, solo exhibitions and um, group exhibitions. Um, I don't think everybody's CV would look like this. Um, you, 
like uh, people have been asking about education. I don't think you need to lead with it. It is, I think, kind of the traditional thing to lead with education, or at least for younger artists, it would be, but it's absolutely not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, and if you have more interesting things to report on your CV than I do, I just have like a bunch of shows that I, you know, I think that would be a great way to stand out. Um, but this is a pretty, like, this is a pretty standard, <laughs> at least I, my understanding of it. it I want to just get a couple more questions in on CVs before we move on. Um, one of the questions, should the CV be one page? Clearly from Catherine's, it doesn't need to be one page. It can be one page, but I think typically, uh, I think generally a resume is more expected to be one page and a CV is more expected to kind of list details. Mm -hmm. And if it goes several pages, then good for you. But if it doesn't, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, the... A couple more questions. One is for Zoe, someone, Lori Hal Halfenstein said she's intrigued by the idea of putting grants or fellowships applied for, assuming you mean even if you didn't get it. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, it really depends on the place that you're applying. And thank you so much for that question. Um, it really depends on where you're applying. Some places want to know and some grant applications want to know how receiving this grant is going to help you uh, in other areas of your art practice. And so sometimes folks want to know or places want to know, um, do you have a couple of grants in process? And you list that or they want to know where you've applied before. And that really talks about the level of ambition. The application itself will let you know if you should do that. Um, for me, it's been very helpful. It's been um, sometimes it's been the ways that I've been able to receive a grant, especially when they know, oh, she's also applied to this place or this other residency. So we want to um, we want to make sure that she's in the running or she receives this grant so that it can help her in her other applications. And so it just depends on the nature of that. And you will know, and you will definitely know they'll let you know that you should include everything. And then another question, if you're someone who does not, this is from Sally Canzanieri, if you are someone who does not have degrees in art, even if you have degrees in other fields, but have taken non-degree workshops and courses in your art field, what is a good way to list that? Um, you could, you can add that in this section in the same way that you would add your education. It's a workshop. It's a part of the learning, or you can have a separate, separate section that says workshops or related experience. I think that that works. Um, and just as a just note, a um, Catherine, I've seen people put their work experience and their education underneath all their exhibitions. And I thought that that was really great too. You're right. It's like, what is the, what is the emphasis? for that application and where you should list that. So definitely, for instance, um, Skowhegan is a residency or considered a colony or residency right now, but you know, back in the day it was a school. And so often you'll see artists list the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture underneath the education area because yeah. of what it historically has been. Or they might list Haystack or Hambidge um, also under education because they went to a workshop or, you know, learned something specific there. Great. So we have a question that's going to lead us actually into the next section, which is, can you distinguish between a resume and a CV and an artist bio? So the next thing we're going to talk about is an artist bio. Um, and I will just share a brief slide of that. Where did it go? So as far as the artist biography, typically what is wanted um, or looked for in that is a shorter, a much shorter and, and more prose version of your CD. So it's usually a single paragraph, maybe two written in the third person. So it's usually like, you know, for me, Gordon attended blah, 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 and, and instead of first person. Um, and that kind of pulls out the most important and most salient accomplishments or features from your CV or your resume. Um, so I'm 
Um, Marcel and Catherine, are there things that you would say in particular about um, writing an artist's bio? Um, I would just say, uh, just try to, um, like, 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 like the previous slide said, um, just try to list in, I guess, a very few, very few sentences, uh, um, your, your history, um, your uh, education and, and your accomplishments, uh, um, including I don't know if mentioning uh, your exhibition history and for um, and you know where you're residing and what you're currently doing. That that that's pretty much what I normally do. But it also so you... it, it, oh sorry. Well, I was just going to say, when we spoke before, you had mentioned that you tend to both look at other people's bios and ask other people to read your bio. Um, yeah, and that, I think that probably reflects more of the artist statements. Um, okay. The bio is more or less, the bio is more or less, you know, uh, a it, it sort of comes from directly from your resume. It comes from your history of your life as an artist. And um, you, you basically, basically take that history and just summarize it into one paragraph, one paragraph or two. You just basically summarize it. Um, so that sort of more or less comes from your own experience and your own resume per se. You just want to kind of break it down into, you know, a few sentences, the most important thing. Yeah, I'd say the bio is kind of, it's sort of an extension of the resume, but in a more understandable and direct format. Um, I try to keep mine as short as possible. I think you can technically do two paragraphs. That's what people say. I keep mine at one and make it as short a paragraph as possible. Try to start with this is just how I do it. I start with uh, one sentence that says generally what I do and what I'm interested in. I make large paper paintings and installations that are dealing with ideas of landscape and identity or whatever. Um, and then I go into like, these are the shows that I've done. This is this is the most impressive stuff that I've done that I want you to know about. That's essentially a, it's a vehicle for me to tell you that. I don't know. I'd be curious to know from you, Zoe. I've always had this sense that the bio doesn't make that much of a difference for applications. It's more for like once you get in, it's a thing for the it's a yeah. thing for press. Is it, that accurate? If I'm not it, you know what? That actually is typically what happens on all the panels that I've been on. We have been uh, we look at CVs, we look at resumes or CVs. And um, and then the bio comes after that after folks have been selected, um, and you're right because it's so brief. There's not a lot of information that could be put in it. Um, I have multiple bios, some that are 30 words, some that are 150, some that are 120, um, some that are third person, and I have a first person bio. Uh, and it really depends on what platform I'm posting these things on. Right, you know, like on Clubhouse, my bio is first person, and it's in many, you know, it's in like two sentence forms, so it goes down, and then I have that 150, one, that 150 that reflects what Marcel is saying. These are the these are the hits. These are the things that I want you to take away. If I was in an elevator and I had to say, "This is who I am," I'll just pull out my cheat sheet and read it. Um, but yeah, you know, that's not the. Um, it's typically not what we're looking for, but here's the space where a bio does the actual work that you need it to in certain kinds of applications. Sometimes that bio is the introduction to the work that you're going to be showing. And so it is a space for someone to be more narrative than they normally would be or more personal than they normally would be. So the bio can function as a way to get into the content of the work as opposed to the, um, the kind of truncated um, resume, right, or narrative format of the resume. 
it's a way for you to say, this is what I'm about and this is why I do what I do. Yeah, it's very interesting because the bio is almost the statement, but it, the bio, I guess, is more or less your, like what you were saying, Zoe, uh, 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 sort of like a history of points where, you, you know, your education briefly, where you live and what you're doing very briefly. And then your artist statement sort of takes up from there. We have a question in the chat. Should the bio include your approach to art as well as accomplishments? And I think this also kind of gets at that, that sometimes fuzzy line between the bio and the statement. Um, you know, as a curator, the bio is something that is used that's more kind of about the artist. Um, you use it to introduce the artist, you use it for, you know, on our website, we'll have the artist bio. And then the statement sometimes is more about kind of the artist's relationship to the artwork. But I'll let the three of you address this question of whether the bio should include the approach as well as the accomplishments. Well, I feel like Zoe is, was kind of touching on that. Um, I, I know that for like I, I started out, but I had a period where my bio was just my accomplishments. It was very dry. Nobody would ever remember it. Like you just kind of read out all of our accomplishments at the beginning of this Zoom call, not Zoom, WebEx call. And like, does anyone remember what any of those were? I, I mean, there. It's just it doesn't hold. It's not. It doesn't. It, it's it's very dry. So I started including at least a little about what I'm about why I'm doing this. And I just feel like it adds some life to what otherwise could be a kind of boring statement. What do you all think? Uh, absolutely. I think if you, like you said, put a little bit of where your art is going, maybe a sentence or two, and that's probably it. Um, because now, I don't know if you want to blend the lines between the bio and the statement. The statement has more of that you know, what your work is about versus, you know, your biography as an artist. So, yeah, a little bit of that about what your work is, you know, because a lot of people want to know what your work is. And then I think that's probably it. Another good idea is to just look at a bunch of um, artist bios online and, you know, just check out the format, see what kind of content people are including. Um, because I think it stops short of a full blown artist statement, but it, it gives, you know, some info on, you know, what they're doing or where they are and maybe a little bit of education. Yeah, ditto to all of that. Um, I, I do think that the bio can function very differently. Like, how would you tell someone about yourself? that is related to your work without even talking about the work. I think that's really important. And I, I, if you would grant me this space, I would love to just read this one little section of a first person part of a bio that I sometimes use. And to Catherine's point, um, yeah, people don't always remember the kind of list of things, but they do remember, we do remember people's stories we typically remember a story. And so I learned that after I had listed this once for one of my bios and someone came and said, oh yeah, I had that experience too. So this is what I wrote. I grew up in the military, primarily in Northern Maine. And someone remembered that. They were like, that's really weird. You are a black American growing up in Northern Maine. And then I wrote, um, throughout my life, I negotiate nu nuanced and layered identities, both prescribed and self-determined as a black woman and an artist and academic. Those are things that people do remember. They remember our stories. We are storytellers and we're story listeners. And so you could think about your bio as a place to really unpack something in 150 words like that. And people love a story. And you can even write that in third person and people will remember that. But they might not remember that, oh, yeah, Zoe went to this school or this thing or this thing, but they will remember a good story. Um, 
do you mind if I, I, I just, there's a question here that I thought was really important about this last section. And mm -hmm. it's from Benice who said, regarding dates and including non-art education and experience, the panels, the panelists are open-minded, thank you. But some artists and reviewers have biases against older artists and against non-fine artists experience. It's conflicting. That's super important. And that's on the other, one of the other reasons why I think it's significant to put dates because often when we're looking at what I'm looking at applications, I'm very mindful of what it means to be an emerging artist, but have had a long career, right? Or to be a 60 year old or 70 year old emerging artist. And sometimes it's really helpful to understand where people are coming from and to be mindful of that, especially, um, especially over the last 10 years, organizations have been um, paying attention and mindful of biases that creep into selection processes. And knowing this information really does catch people, right, and organizations and say, we're not going to discriminate. We can't, um, you know, uh, we want to acknowledge unconscious biases in the selection of people. And it, it makes people aware that um, we're all, we are at different, tra we have different trajectories, different histories, different life circumstances. And so knowing this information is really helpful, right? I love to use someone like Deborah Roberts as an example. Deborah was in her mid to late fifties when, when she really started showing um, in a different part of the art worlds, right? That are out there. And, um, and that would not have happened if she um, held on to um, this um, construction that only um, that only emerging artists or artists that get noticed are you know under the age of 35. This kind of leads to the next question or is related to the next question in the chat, which is if the bio is not addressed on an equal level as the CV, how would an artist who has experienced drama in their life that created a lengthy gap in exhibiting or achieving CV material break through to the point that their bio might be, might then be read? And I think that's a question for people in all different fields as well, is sort of how do you address those breaks in your CV that might have to do with your personal life or other circumstances um, and still get the attention you deserve for the experience you do have? I'd say that that's like one thing that the bio really can do is like your CV. It's just a, it's just a list and it is relatively kind of structured. Um, there's not as much wiggle room for you to really show who you are. And the, the statement about, um, the reviewers who have biases, it's true that like you're kind of attempting to fit yourself into some, there are some boxes in the art world. You're supposed to have some as some exhibition experience um, and it's supposed to you're supposed to have a solo show. You're supposed to have a group show. But I think the, the last thing that you want to do is try to like fit yourself into the crowd. Um, whenever you're applying to things, you're applying in company of hundreds of other people, dozens of other people. And it's so easy to get uh, passed over anything that makes you stand out, um, then that's something that's actually going to be a boon for you. Um, and your bio is a way for you to, I wouldn't, I don't think you never, never make excuses, um, right. about like a gap or whatever. That's you're a human being living, living your life. Um, but it's a way for you to flush out your practice. And I think this might be a good transition into the artist statement too, because um, it is true that some grants don't ask for the bio, some do, um, some only ask for them after the fact. Um, for instance, Art Bank asks for the CV and the statement, but not the bio up front. So um, let me just share a slide about the artist statement. And we can talk a little bit about that because I think this is definitely another place where you can tell your story um, and, and catch the attention of the, of the panelists. Um, 
So as far as an artist statement, generally one or two paragraphs. This one, I would say in general is written first person. Obviously, as Zoe mentioned, there's some, you know, wiggle room on all of these things. Um, but here's where you kind of describe your process, your ideas and inspirations. And in the case of a grant application, I think it it should really relate to the specific body of work that that you're submitting for that grant. So again, this is another place where you might be tailoring your statement to whatever it is you're using it for. Um, uh, Catherine, when we spoke earlier, you said that it's really easy to write a bad statement and really hard to explain how to write a good one, but let's give it a try <laughs> oh my and, <laughs> and say some things about how to write a strong artist statement. I rewrite my artist statement for pretty much every year, maybe. Um, I have many different versions of my artist statement, even though I'm not the kind of artist that has very different types. My work changes, but it changes kind of in an, a slow evolution rather than giant um, leaps and bounds. I'm not making like radically different work than I was a few years ago, but I do change my artist statement because I want to, it's a way to, just like um, the CV um, and looking at your portfolio images, it's a way to look back into your practice and see what you're taking for granted. Um, I, I looked at some of my older statements because I keep them all and sometimes I pick and choose elements from them for different grants. Um, in preparation for this talk and I one thing that I saw was in some of the older statements I felt like they were very tentative a little bit vague um and one thing that really helped me I had a conversation with a friend um Makita Ahuja was a painter who's now uh in the New York area but she was based in Baltimore um and she looked at my statements and said you need to you need to um, act as if you belong in the art history books. Um, like you actually belong in the canon. Like where, what, like why would, what would somebody say if you were in an art history book? What would they write? Um, and if you're not thinking about yourself that way, you're, you're not being bold enough. Um, and that statement like still feels a little bit crazy to me, um, but it did help to think about what is actually really unique about what I make and how is it specific to me um, and why should anybody care? Because if I'm only going to talk about these kind of vagaries that you often see in artist statements, um, art speak that doesn't really mean anything, that's just a way of being tentative um, and nobody, and it's not going to stick in anyone's head. Um, another thing that helps that has helped me is to have other people read like Makita and then like, you know, give me criticism and that also includes um, non artists. I've given my statement to writers. Um, poets uh, and had them edit it and rewrite it for me and then looked back and set seeing if it made sense for me and I'll kind of eventually cobble it together to what I currently use. And Marcel, that you had talked before about um, the statement being something that drives the discussion about the work or that kind of enters into the artistic discourse about the work. Can you say more about that? Yeah. Uh, yes, I think it's um, like what Catherine was saying. Uh, one of the important things about your statement is you, you, you sort of have to make sure that it's um, Unique it provides a unique perspective to your work. And so I think a good practice is as you are if you're you know thinking about your artist statement, think about your statement and how your statement drives the work that you're doing and how the body of doing reflects your artist statement. So they if you're you know if you're trying to um, when you're trying to win this fellowship or win, you know, the, the, you know, the Washingtonian awards or whatever, you had to sort of 
remember that your statement, because these questions are going to come up in the application, how the statement reflects the and how the body of work reflects the statement. And you want to, as you're, you know, thinking about the statement and you're writing your statement, make sure that it's, um, that it's uh, unique, you know, it's, it's a unique perspective uh, to you. I want to kind of make sure your statement stands apart from other artists, um, but at the same time reflects the work that you're doing. Um, but I, I would also say if you're sort of new to developing statements or, you know, you're having troubles or whatever, just go out there to Google or go check out some publications and, and check out other artists and kind of see uh, the different sort of um, statements that they're writing. And, you know, that, that'll kind of give you some ideas on, okay, how uh, unique or how, how you want to drive yours, your statement. Bottom line is you want to make sure that your statement is interesting, but at the same time, you want to make sure that it reflects your body of work, uh, and and that is that the body of work and your statement are are, co are cohesive. Yeah, you know one of the things as a panelist um, that uh, can be really frustrating is when people are applying for an opportunity like Art Bank and they're submitting a body of work, but their um, statement has no relationship to it at all. Um, that is that is frustrating, especially when it's needed because of the kind of work that it is. Maybe it's, you know, non-narrative, et cetera, um, abstract or something like that. Um, um, also, what, as panelists, we're also cautioned and aware of not penalizing people for the writing, right? So you're looking at the work itself. At, in a situation in which the writing would be very helpful, it's always beneficial for it to mirror the work that one is submitting. If I could give you a quick story, um, I think I've been submitting uh, applications for, I don't know, maybe 20, 15 to 20 years or going back that far. And um, I would say in the beginning, I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't winning anything. I wasn't really getting any love. And I mean, I think my work was, was beautiful. I was selling work, but um, for whatever reason, I was not winning the awards, the fellowships. And it wasn't until I went back to school and sort of got an education on, um, you know, artist statements and art. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that people have to do that, but I think it's very important that people understand that um, if you apply to a grant, like the Individual Fellowship Award, you, you want to kind of treat the grant like a, a contemporary gallery. So if you're going to treat it like a temporary gallery, you have to submit, you know, a unique, artist, a unique body of art, number one, but the body of art needs to mirror the, the statement. You know what I mean? It has to mirror your, art, your artistic statement and, and they have to be cohesive and they have to be sort of unique into your own perspective of, you know, of life. Um, you want to make sure that your body of art sort of reflects, uh, you know, how you see certain things. It could be politics or something, some social issues or whatever, but you want to make sure that it is a personal reflection of how you see things. And the more personal your perspective or unique your statement and your body of work is, to me, you're going to have a better chance of winning your fellowship or the Washingtonian awards. That that's how I sort of uh, uh, go through um, submitting my my uh, applications. 
There's a question in the chat. When does when do the images of the work become more powerful than the artist's statement, or is the statement the quote sales pitch? I think it depends on the thing that you're applying for. There are certainly grants that exist out there, awards that exist that don't even require a portfolio at all. It is only about your statement and your proposal. Um, but I think that most, tell me if I'm wrong, you guys, I, I, the vast majority probably of uh, things that you're going to apply to as an artist, nobody's going to even look at your statement. <laughs> Or they'll look at it at the very end. I mean, we're spending a lot of time on your resume, your bio, and your CV, but it's like 95% your portfolio and then 5% all these other things. Your portfolio is like what people... So I, I'm a judge for the Bethesda Painting Awards right now. We just did um, a long session looking at the semifinalists um, and looking at the looking at everyone who applied. And you're... As a... Judge, I think that most of the time you're you're looking at the work that it, it is it powerful, is it specific, is it sensitive? Those are things that you can tell by looking at the the statement is going to help to give context and to give a larger sense of your body of work. But I think a lot of the time people don't even don't even see it. Yeah, I would agree with I would agree with Catherine. I mean, it's it's the work is the most important thing. I think percent of the time, I, I I haven't even heard of those uh oh, those grants that don't even need the body of work. But normally, well, especially for this one, if you're, if you're talking about um, DC Commissioner for the Arts and Humanities, you definitely the the art is the most important thing. But if you can bring in your to sort of uh, answer any questions or to make sense of the body of work and to make people say, oh, wow, oh, oh my God, this is, now I see what you're doing. Now I see what your work is about. That That is definitely an added plus. So, yeah, the artist always normally the most important thing, the statement is just going to bring it home and make it make sense for the panelists. Yeah, I'd say that's and that's where like specificity and uh, how individual your statement is. That's where it really, really helps. And I can promise you, if you look at your statement right now, it's probably too vague. Uh, or at least most of us, uh, definitely me. Um, <laughs> so easy to just be kind of gen general or generic. And um, I've had. Uh, I think one helpful thing is if you gave your statement to someone and then gave like a bunch of random images of work from many different artists that include yours, would they be able to know which one was yours from reading your statement? Um, they should. And a lot of the time, a lot of statements, they wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. That's going, great. Back I, to, I... going back, going back to what she said, Tanner, like, like what I, I'm sorry. Again, 10 or 15 years ago, I think my statements were too big until I got a little bit of education on how to home in on the statements, on how to um, write a statement and just specific on your perspective on certain things. And if you can sort of bring those um, ideas into a succinct statement, then you're on the right track. I think before then came to the campaign. It's a little more specific in the statement. It 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 uh it helps to support the body of work. So in the spirit of the work being the most important thing. Um, I think maybe we should move on and talk about the portfolio. Um, oops. I will share just another slide to get us going. The slide doesn't say much, but I'm sure we'll have a lot to say. Um, you know, one thing is to consider the grant criteria, and I think that the panelists can say more about this. Um, I will say that for CAH grants, um, if you look at the call for um, applications, we lay out very specific criteria. 
um, and it's all weighted and everything. And so it's important to look at that when you're applying. And that is a place where I think your CV and statement can do some things to address those criteria that may be outside of the work itself. Um, you want to be submitting a coherent body of work. Um, you know, sometimes you're submitting five images, sometimes more, um, and then work that contributes to the artistic discourse. So those are just some things to kind of get us started. Um, but I'd love to hear from the panels kind of when you're deciding what works you're actually going to submit for a particular grant. Um, how does that process go for you? And then for the panelists, for Zoe, when you're looking at the group of works that's been submitted, um, you know, what makes an impact? What makes a strong group of works? Well, I could kind of say, again, if you are, you know, submitting, if you know you're going to submit an application to um, DC Arts, uh, DC Commission for the Arts and Humanities, it might be helpful to sort of uh think about what your new body of work is going to be and um how you're going to commute with your artist statement um simultaneously if you can kind of pull those thing two things together at the same time i think it's going to be a lot more you, you could you're going to be a lot more successful because Again, you want your body of work to reflect your statement and your statement to reflect your body of work. You don't want, you know, you might have some beautiful figure figurines and or some still lifes over here, but and some, I don't know, cosmological paintings, but if they don't reflect the, the artist's statement, it doesn't really matter how beautiful they are because the work is not cohesive, you know what I mean? And so you want to make sure your your work sort of follows uh, under the umbrella of your statement. And now you're going to have a better chance of of winning the award. But at the same time, you also have to make sure your your body of work at at, at the best as the best that you can do um, is unique to your style and sort of bring something you want to kind of. See if, you're, if your work can bring something new to the table. I think what I said before, you want to kind of make, you want to try to treat the, the fellowships like a contemporary gallery who, who you know, a gallery sees all kinds of artists, they see all kinds of statements, but if you can kind of bring something unique to the, um, in terms of your artwork and your statement, you're, you're going to have a lot, a bigger, a lot better chance of, of, of winning. I like that idea of like thinking of it as a gallery and maybe your your application is you putting together a show of your absolute best work right like how how can the show be cohesive how can it make sense how can it speak to speak to people i love that yeah i'm also looking for consistency um in applications and uh, even if it's across two bodies of work. So if you have room to put in, or if you need to put in 12 slides and you don't have enough of one body, then use two specific bodies of work and actually talk about that in your statement. Um, cohesion always, um, always stands out. Cohesiveness always stands out. Um, I try to just like I've been kind of repeating um, as I have many different versions of resumes and I have many different versions of, of statements. I also keep um, I, on my computer, I sort everything by the year and then every application, I keep all of the images in a folder of that application. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll have, you know, from 2015, I applied to 12 things and they're each in a folder and I can and I keep the images, the portfolio, the images that I use for each of those applications so I can look back. Oh, and then I say whether I got the thing or not. So I can look back and see what were the combinations of images that that worked for me. 
um, and what did it. It's not that that it actually means anything because applying to things is total, such a crapshoot so much of the time. Um, but it is helpful to know that, you know, this, this got through, I, I got the thing and now I can remember um, to just keep a record of everything that you do. Um, and I also try to, I generally try to show up with my uh, more recent work. Um, just so that I can have like a sense of uh, how my work is progressing, progressing and keep mm -hmm. things up to date. Um, I don't know if we want to talk. Is this the time to talk about documentation? This is the perfect time for that. I do have a couple slides and I assume you're talking about how you photograph your work. Mm -hmm. Is that what you meant? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it is important when you are applying for grants, you know, so much of it is happening with just um, digital images. For Art Bank, we have two rounds of review. The first round, we're just looking at digital images. The second round, we have you bring in the artwork um, before we decide whether or not to acquire it. But for most of the other grants, it's just digital images. And so you really do need to put some care into how you are um, documenting or photographing your artwork. This is just a, you know, a example slide to show you that these two artworks almost don't look like the same thing, right? The one on the left, um, is in kind of dark lighting, it's not angled properly, it's not cropped, and the one on the right, um, you know, has done all of those things. Um, oops, I don't know what that funny thing in the middle is, but um, this is just a note to say that you can often, it depends on, you know, some of these portals where you're submitting the work can be kind of picky, but it can be useful if it's possible to, in, to include, um, uh, detail of your work just to really show the texture of it. Um, you may also include uh, if it's, you know, extraordinarily large or small and you really want to emphasize that size, you may want to include uh, an image that shows something for scale, which is not what that funny gray thing is there. But um, so those are just a couple of um, thoughts about uh, photographing your artwork, but happy to hear more from the panel about, about that aspect of the application. I would just jump in there and just say, if, if you can uh, afford a professional photographer, that's probably um, hire someone to take, you know, photos. Um, that's what I do on occasion. I can't always do that. So when I think and before, um, when I don't have an opportunity to hire someone, uh, I will wait for a, uh, a day of sunshine or a, a sunny day and try to take some pictures outside where the sun is actually providing, you know, ample sunlight, but um, just making sure that the um, the 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 photo uh, doesn't have glare on it. You know, you put it, you angle it in a way where there's not sun glare. Uh, but you also want to make sure to crop your image where you're just seeing the paint. You don't want to see the easel. You don't want to see you know um, the background, back back grass or or whatever the wall or whatever that's in the background you want to um try to crop everything out. you can't crop it out normally i mean nowadays you can do a lot of these cropping things on your phone if you can't do it on your phone you know maybe try to get someone to do it with photoshop but i think most of the time you can do uh uh pretty adequate um cropping on your phone or you know put you know uh, taking photos taking photos in adequate cropping on your phone. Um, yeah, I agree with that. Um, it's quite shocking to me how bad I am at taking my own photos and how good real photographers are can make my work. It's really, um, I see Gail is here. We just hired a photographer together uh, and <laughs> getting look, getting those images back and then comparing them to what I was able to do with my limited skills is like quite eye opening. And I can't imagine how many 
opportunities I've missed out on because um, I just wasn't able to to represent my work to its fullest extent. Um, another thing I'd say, I, this is probably too big a topic to really address here, but like, if you don't have some Photoshop skills, you need to acquire those Photoshop skills. Um, just, you know, to, to, to a certain extent, um, to be able to really make your work, um, stand yeah, out. If you're missing, if you're missing out, I would say send, send your stuff to me. I'll crop them for you. <laughs> I, mean, I, got <laughs> I got, you know, Photoshop skills and cropping skills, but, you know, I think to, <laughs> yeah, we, just cropping skills. you know, just going back, because technology has advanced so far, even on the phone, you can sort of do these things, uh, not necessarily with a professional, I would say go with a professional, but you don't need to, if you can, um, you know, find some adequate sunlight outside and you're able to sort of crop some things on your phone or find someone who knows how to do that, then um, you, it's nothing really to be uh, too um, stressed out. Yeah. Zoe, I would love to hear, oh, I would love to hear from the panelist perspective, kind of what your response is when you see images that obviously were yeah. professionally photographed or, or at least have you know, been cropped and lit properly versus ones that aren't. Yeah. Um, and there's also a question in the chat, but I can follow that after you, after you say something. Um, yeah, you know, uh, it is, you know, there, as a panel, you know, there are certain things that are, that are frustrating, especially if you might be familiar with the work of an artist or um, a certain kind of process and you don't see it represented very well because the photos, the documentation isn't strong. Um, it is frustrating to see blurry images, um, images that are skewed, right? That um, images that have been taken kind of on the fly, like the one on the easel that you took where we saw the, you know, we saw the background patterns, you know, that interfered with the, with it or the way that light rakes across um, a surface and it doesn't actually add to more information. So that's been one, that's one of the most frustrating things to see. Um, yes, yes, it's true, it's true that not everybody is able to have their artwork professionally photographed. However, there are ways that you can kind of circumvent that, right, within your um, capabilities. And, um, and so you always want to have, you know, put your best foot forward um, with your imagery because that's the thing that leads it. It's not like folks said earlier, um, it's not always the writing, it's the images, right? This is all the, the documentation. Um, I've always heard that it's great to take photographs on an overcast day so that all the light is even outside. Um, and, um, and so that you, know, you can see the details. And I also think that those detail shots that you showed, um, Sarah, were great. Uh, sometimes it's, it's important to see um, especially with a painting that has a lot of texture to see the edges or to see the kind of profile of the image so that we get a sense of, of uh, the material that you're using. So I actually enjoy seeing that as a panelist, um, all of those things to kind of get into the nuances of the work, to use those second and third slots for images to do that. But yeah, I want to see strong images or images that convey to the best of that person's ability, the work itself. So we have a few questions coming in, in the chat. Um, if a limited quantity of images is to be submitted, is sculpture disadvantaged if only one photo or one angle per piece is included? Mm. I would say no, that sculpture does not have to be disadvantaged um, because you, if there are limited images and you have um, enough slots for 12, then that's, then you possibly submit six sculptures or eight sculptures so that you can do multiple sides of one. And so sculpture doesn't have to be. And typically, um, applications take into account, especially if it's for a broad range of artistic practices, they will actually have room 
for that to be able to happen so that you can show so multiple can show kinds of images kinds for of the images. piece. Okay, another question from Michael Crossett um, regarding photos and cropping. Isn't it important to show the full piece of work along with some of the wall to show depth and quality of the piece versus tightly cropping to the artwork? I think that depends on the piece um, and how important the edges are. So I don't actually crop my work because uh, I often will cut the edges in wonky ways and it's a part of the work. Um, they're paper pieces, but I just kind of cut them badly on purpose. Um, and so I'll put them into onto a white wall, photograph the piece, um, and then have the white behind and I don't fully crop it because if I were to fully crop it, I would lose um, some of the integrity of the work. But if you just happen to have, like, if you don't have a white wall, or if the piece is just pretty straight rectilinear, then I would say that's kind of up to you. I'd, a piece that has a little bit of white on the edges versus a piece that's tightly cropped, they, those both look good. What do you all think? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think Catherine's right. Um, I, 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 it, it especially for, let's say, you know, three dimensional pieces of, of work. Um, I would sort of, I, I would say if you, if you have two dimensional pieces or if you have a painting, I would say um, what's worked for me is cropping, you know, as tight as you can, you know, along the edges of your work. And then you can always uh, uh, input the size of your piece within the application. So, um, because now, you know, you're, you're showing, uh, that you care about the, the display of your work, you're, you, you care about, um, uh, the tightness that you have displayed your, your, your photograph, um, and that you're trying to pay attention to, to, to details. And I think, I think all of that helps in terms of the, how a panelist how panelist perspective might view you and how you uh, care about your work. So, yeah, if you're if you're doing a two dimensional piece of of artwork, I normally crop it without showing any sort of framing or anything. Um, yeah, without showing any framing or anything, and and just making sure that you have a good quality image. So they can see, you know, colors, um, details, you know what I mean? You don't want it blurry, but you, you just want a nice, tight uh, image, just like as if you were, again, submit to a contemporary gallery. You know what I mean? You want quality images. All right, we have a couple more questions. One, I'm going to take this one first because it's kind of related, and then we'll go back to the video film question. Um, if the artist is making, this is from Gard Jones, if the artist is making sculptural work whose intent is an ambiguity of perception, i.e. is it flat, is it real, is it there, then should the portfolio document the fabrication rather than represent the work as it would be viewed in a gallery? That's hard, I wish I could see the work. That sounds really cool. The work sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I don't know. What do you all think about that? Wow. Could you read that question one more time? Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, can you do that? <laughs> okay. If, if the artist is making sculptural work whose intent is an ambiguity of perception, so i.e. is it flat, is it real, is it there? This is the ambiguity of perception. Then... Should the portfolio document the fabrication rather than represent the work as it would be viewed in a gallery? You know, is this right? What a, I know, I now I'm curious about this work. I want to see this work too. Um, you know, th that's a really hard one because it depends on the application. If the application is for finished work, then you're you it would probably be um, better to install. Oh, thank you. I will check out your link. Um, I would probably install it the best way that you can, you know, um, especially, you know, if there's, 
you know, understanding that you might have limited space maybe, um, but I would document it in the way that it, you expect it to be seen in the gallery. I think that's important. Or, or maybe both. Yeah. Like what if you had, yeah. you, you take two images from your portfolio for it. So one as it, it would be seen and then one with the documentation or one of the, the work in progress. Um, and I think that a lot of the time you always are able to put in an image list or description yeah. of the image. You would include a description of, of um, some of these important points in the actual image list um, so that people can get more of a sense of, of what they're looking at. I think that would yeah. be really important. And if you have a smaller version um, or a mock-up, that's always great to include too so that people get a side understanding or panelists get an understanding of the scale and the scope of that work. So I think that, that, I think that that's completely fine. Um, I don't always mind in progress images documentation if it really is about the, um, if the process is about the way that it's supposed to be experienced in the end, right? And so I just wouldn't include in progress images just to make up for, um, or just to have, images to submit. Okay, another question from the chat. Any tips for video or film portfolios? Oh man. Ooh, oh my gosh, that's a rough one. So um, yes, so yes. make sure that the the file, I know I hear a hissing, do you hear that, Sarah? It's like a, right. So just make a sure- A little bit, if everyone could mute themselves, that would help. Um, just be mindful of the file format that you are uploading to make sure it's viewable. If there are, if there is an opportunity to have a still image, grab a really good still, like a, a, a screenshot or a still image, um, and check with someone else to make sure that screenshot or the still image is actually one of the more interesting parts of the clip. And also, I always think it's great when there is a video piece that someone is submitting, but at the very beginning of the video piece, they actually have a still image as the lead in, and then it goes into the video itself. I always find that really helpful. Another question, how about including, and this is from Warren Carther, how about including composite um, photos of sculpture slash public art, one or two angles in one image? Some applications do not want that. So it really depends on the application. And you would need to call the, um, the organization to make sure that can happen. I, I think this might just be my own personal opinion, but I feel like that takes away from the impact of the work when you're trying to stuff many different images within one image. Um, I would just curate your portfolio so that, yes, you are including uh, a detail shot or an installation shot. It takes another portfolio image to do so, um, but that just might be me. There are a couple of questions that I missed that were in the Q&A from Jennifer Sonkin, and they're a little outdated at this point, but Jennifer, if you want to explain what you were asking about, um, there are questions about current work versus um, work in progress. Yeah, I'm, I wanna, um, yeah, I want to make sure I understood. Marcel mentioned when um, presenting a portfolio, um, something about even talking about future projects or a project coming up. I don't know if I understood that correctly. So I wanted to get some clarity on that. Was that, did I understand that correctly, Marcel? Like in, in, in terms of uh, uh, last statement, pretty much no, work, uh, is that where we were talking your about? Body, your body of work. Oh, oh, okay. So I think all I was saying was, um, so going back to school sort of forced me into doing this, like, uh, think as I was creating a body of work, sort of think about, um, 
how are you going to write it? How are you going to document your, how are you going to talk about your body of work in writing? And, and as you're thinking about that, how is that going to drive the imagery? Of so I, I, all I was trying to say was, if you can sort of think about the two things, like if you're starting over, if you're, you're in a position to start over with a body of work or whatever, uh, if you're in a position to think about the two things simultaneously, how, you know, if you want to start talking about whatever, whatever social issues or, or whatever, whatever interests you, um, if you can start thinking about how you can lay that down in writing and how this writing, what, you know, whatever you're writing can influence your body and work and how they sort of reflect each other. So by the time you submit them for an exhibition or for a grant or whatever, uh, everything is going to be consistent and everything is going to be cohesive. So, because, you know, when panelists or when gallery artists look at your statement, they, they want to make sure that you, your, 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 your work is consistent. That's the way they sort of think about it as a serious artist. You know what I'm saying? And if everything sort of makes sense in terms of your, your statement and your body of work, then you're going to have a, a, a better chance of, of, you know, winning the fellowship or, or getting inside the, 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 the exhibition. Thank you, Marcel. That was kind of a really nice, like, synopsizing statement there. We're getting to, um, we're getting to the time where we have to close. Um, this has been really fruitful, I think, and I hope the audience agrees. Um, I really appreciate your time, Catherine, Marcel, and Zoe. I do want to share a couple more things before we close. Um, let's see. Um, we have a few more events coming up um, at the um, commission, and I just want to mention them before we say our final thank you to our panelists. Um, we have a really great artist showcase coming on, up on April 22nd, which is called Word Sound Power, and we're featuring some of our current grantees who are poets and jazz musicians, um, and this will be um, streamed on the 22nd. I think Ron is dropping links in the chat for all of these upcoming events. Uh, we have an exhibition up now in our virtual gallery called Our City Ourselves, Women Photograph Washington, and we have a closing event coming up in May but during the whole run of the exhibition, we're asking photographers across the district to take pictures of the district, post them on social media, tag our city CAH um, and the ward it was taken in or the neighborhood or the, um, the location. And we're starting to kind of share all of these images um, through social media and we'll feature some of them in the closing event on May 22nd. And then just in case you're interested in seeing um, more of our art bank collection. Um, we have a YouTube channel. We have an e-museum. You can check out the art bank um, online at your convenience. This is my contact information. If you want to reach out to me about any of the grants, if you want to get in touch with any of the panelists, um, you are welcome to reach out. And are there, if there are any final um, Final things anyone would like to say, I really, again, just want to extend so much gratitude to Catherine, Zoe, and Marcel. This has been hugely informative. Um, as I said at the beginning, it has been recorded and will be available, and we'll send that link out to everyone. So I just think, you know, if you're starting to think about the next grant cycle as it opens up this spring, um, you know, please keep in mind all of this amazing advice that these artists were able to provide. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you all. Great fun. Thank you so much. Bye. We'll stay on here just for a couple minutes in case you want to grab any of those links from the chat. <laughs>